I am fiercely committed to women being powerful and free and it's as solid as they can possibly be in the biggest, baddest self that they can possibly be. And one of the ways that we can be that is if, if we choose to be in partnership to have someone who really has your back, who's really for you, who has both of his hands on your back, pushing you forward into the world, going, go, go, be big, be amazing. So instead of having an adversary, you actually have a partner. Hey, you. Thanks for tuning in. Just a quick heads up. This episode is rated R, so expect that there will be some language that you may not want your kids to hear, lots of adult topics, and quite possibly some explicit conversations about sex. This episode is probably not safe for work, though, you know, I guess it depends on where you work. Welcome to Pleasure Central Radio, the place to rethink the assumptions we don't even realize we are making that keep us from getting what we truly want out of work, life, and love. Here is your sneak peek into an authentic, pleasure-focused conversation. Well, hello, Wendy, and welcome back to Pleasure Central Radio. Thank you for having me, Rebecca. It's really good to be back. (laughs) Thank you. It's really good to see you here. It's interesting. I've been thinking a lot this week about entrepreneurship and how this whole COVID situation is affecting my entrepreneur friends. And you're one of the entrepreneur friends who I consider to be a peer, somebody who is doing a lot of similar things in the world and doing them really, really well. And I saw recently on Facebook, you have a new program and it sounded really intriguing. So I wanted to bring you on the podcast and have you share about it and see what new things we can learn about ourselves today. Well, thanks for having me. Do you want me to dive in and tell you all about it? I say yes. Let's dive in. We'll skip the foreplay today. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Straight to the point. I'm hungry right away. So (laughs) I have spent 17 years in the realm of workability and partnership and understanding each other and getting the best from each other and And that was my day job and my life and my passion. And I learned a lot from the company I worked for, from the men that I had interviewed, from the women I had led workshops to. I learned a lot. And as a single person, I had to go on 121 first dates to meet my now husband, Dave. And I want to share a little bit about this program because it really took form on our very second date. Do you want to come with me on our second date? Can I please? (laughs) Can I be the third wheel on your second date? (laughs) (laughs) So Ethiopian restaurant, Oakland, California, delicious meal. I'm staring across the table at this gorgeous man. Our plates are empty. I'm bummed out that the date is going to end because we're having such a good time. I mean, he's hot. He's smart. He's amazing. And I, I just didn't want this date to end, to which he said, let's let's go get coffee. And and I said, it's almost 10 o'clock at night. And he said, that's that's just a euphemism. Let's just, I just want to be with you. Let's go more places. <gasps> he just wants to be with me. So we go for ice cream. We're walking around. This turns into this epic like six hour hangout date. And on the date, we're uncovering all these amazing topics about our past and what we care about and who we are and what we're hoping for. And at one point, somewhere around the fifth hour, he kind of, kind of looked down at the sidewalk with his ice cream and he wanted to share something, but he got a little tentative about it. And then he changed the subject and I really wanted to know what he was going to say, right? And then I figured out a way to sort of circle back and pick it up. And he got a little tentative again. Like maybe if he shared that thing, he'd be in trouble. Or I wouldn't like him or I would judge him or something. It was something shameful. And I wanted to know what it was so bad. I just blurted out, you could tell me anything. You're never going to be in trouble with me. Oh. 
Now, once those words were out of my mouth, you're never going to be in trouble with me. I thought, damn it. Can I take it back? (laughs) If I'm going to be in a relationship with this person, obviously for the long haul, at some point you will be in trouble with me. I mean, I guess if I'm a woman of my word, I guess I just better tap this and move on. (laughs) Clearly, I've just blown it. It can't meant to last now. And then I took a deep breath and I thought, wait a minute, what if? What if I could live a life with another human in partnership, living under the same roof and never, ever having them be in trouble with me? Wow. What a wild and weird place to come from, right? Wow. Yeah. That's pretty good to me. I know. And never in trouble is, is really where the rubber meets the road for being with someone where nobody is misbehaving. And it's just super counter culture, right? And, and I thought, well, what would that take? And I started this investigation with myself and with him as I got to know him better to see, could he be that person? And one of the very first things I discovered is in order to be with somebody where no one's ever in trouble, you have to have really high integrity. <laughs> I mean, both sides have to have super squeaky clean, high integrity willing to cough up whatever there is to cough up and be honest about, right? And no passive aggressive crap. You can't do any of that. So uh, luckily he was that man. And, and when he heard me say it, you're never, in, you could, you're never going to be in trouble with me. He told me much later, he said, that was the most adorable thing that I ever heard. And I smiled to myself because I knew you were lying and that you didn't mean to lie, that you were even lying to yourself. Uh And it's shocking to see that all these years later, you meant it. (gasps) Damn. I know, right? Seven and a half years, never in trouble. Wow. What a beautiful relationship that must be. It's pretty great. It, it, It can be, you know, it's, it doesn't mean that he doesn't hurt my feelings or I don't hurt his feelings. It doesn't mean that things don't go wrong. I mean, life is messy, right? I, I can be unconscious sometimes. And so can he from time to time, I'm worse at it than he is. So it's not like things don't trip us, but we deal with the thing, not react to each other. What a difference. Yeah. It's pretty useful. So I started living this way. I had a really great head start because I had had 17 or about at at that point, I'd had about a decade's worth of work in understanding partnership and understanding men in new ways and really leading to workshops to women so much so that I not only knew myself, but I know women pretty well. We're different flavors. We have different thoughts, ideas, and, and, and preferences, but there are there are absolutely concerns we all have in 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 any in gender right there there are certain things that we're all working for to have peace and harmony and respect and love for each other so our issues are similar and and i really had already gotten a pretty big grasp on how men and women can team in a much more effective way and then i took what i was learning from this new relationship with someone who was endlessly fascinated with how to partner well and created this program called happy and love happy and love sounds fluffy I, I, in the beginning i hated the title happy and love it sounds super fluffy <laughs> but if you but if you really think about it like if you're going to be living with someone for a really long time if you're going to spend a ridiculous amount of hours through your lifetime with somebody, wouldn't you want to be happy in love? <laughs> wouldn't that be something you'd strive for? So I think, even though I thought the title was fluffy, I like it. I think it. that would be pretty high on my list of priorities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And so that program was born and I turned it into a self-guided uh, 10 session audio and video for, for women to partner well with. 
with anybody, really. Wow. So you mean I could go and binge watch this in the next two days and have a completely different perspective on something? Yes. Wow. You could you could binge one little snack bite of 15 minutes and change your life forever. Snack bite, a 15 minute snack bite that will improve my relationship. That sounds pretty amazing. Great. I know. So tell me more. How do I get this program? How do I find these snack bites? You can get it at wendyspeaks.com. And it's on the homepage. It's also under workshops. It's called Happy in Love. Now, I put all of my courses under the name of love. So there's another one called Ready for Love. That's not it. That's a dating workshop. Ready for Love is getting ready for love. That's dating. I'm talking about the relationship workshop called Happy in Love. And really, it's for people who are already in a relationship. It's also for people who are wanting to build a relationship. If you're a single woman and you want it, and you want that relationship, and you want to build a solid foundation from the very start, it's a really great place to start. Yeah, I can imagine. Before you ever even meet them. Yeah. What a great way to spend your time in quarantine if you've got to be alone anyway. Prepave for your yep. future loving relationship. Yeah. And I'm often asked, can I watch it with my partner? And is it for men? And here's the thing. I'm sorry. I am a leader of women. I just am. I love men. I really love men and their lives benefit from my work, but I lead to women. So I designed it for women. It's for women. Um, It, I distinguish a lot about men, but Definitely, if you're in a relationship with women too, it's also really useful. So do couples watch it together? Yep. I'm talking to women though. (laughs) So so there's that. That is good to know. That's very good to know. What are in the snack bites, Wendy? Okay, besides figuring out how to live a life where no one's ever in trouble, I talk about the ways that we bring out the worst in men and the ways that we bring out the best in men. And I want to be really clear about something. This is not about catering and accommodating men. You know, our culture does plenty of that. (laughs) This is not lift up the patriarchy. This isn't that thing. I am fiercely committed to women being powerful and free And it's as solid as they can possibly be in the biggest, baddest self that they can possibly be. And one of the ways that we can be that is if if we choose to be in partnership, to have someone who really has your back, who's really for you, who has both of his hands on your back, pushing you forward into the world, going, go, go, be big, be amazing. So instead of having an adversary, you actually have a partner. And that's part of what I'm teaching, how to bring out the best naturally in men so they can support you well instead of bringing out the worst which is pretty common and in one segment it's probably my favorite segment I talk about the four big troublemakers in nearly every relationship that turns a relationship into an adversarial one and we all do it it's all knee-jerk natural responses the big four troublemakers. And I uncover those and distinguish them and, and show you how they show up in our culture and what to do instead. Are you going to tease us with one of them? Yes. (laughs) One of the things that we naturally do when we get into a relationship is we start to talk about the relationship rules and what we can trust each other for. And hopefully you can trust him for everything because you love him and he's the one. Or one of the ones. <laughs> <laughs> for, yes, for people like me. Yeah, yeah. So you just like cl- close your eyes really tight and cross your fingers and hope that you can trust them for all the things you need them to trust to trust them for, which is everything. Which they haven't proven anything with you with a track record of what you could actually trust them for. Right? And then you create rules around what you want, need, and desire. Yeah, you know, I I can see how this is really common, and I can also see how it feels like a giant trap. 
like even me in relationships, thinking about rules and boundaries and things like that, I prefer agreements. It's such, such a different way of approaching it. You agree on yeah. something versus yeah. having rules and boundaries and edges, then you're treating the other person as a person with their own yeah. desires and interest in life and fulfillment plan. And what happens with rules? They get broken. <laughs> Yes. Rules are made to be broken, right? And then what happens when a rule gets broken? Somebody gets hurt. The relationship is broken. Mm. And oftentimes it's broken and can't ever recover because of the offense of the broken trust and broken rule. Yeah. I feel like this is a, a, a thing that I've been pondering about boundaries for a long time if you have a boundary and this is your edge and somebody crosses it you're fucked yeah and there's been there's there's gonna be a big difference between a rule and what's just never gonna be okay yes right? there are there are criminal acts that someone could commit that would have me never ever partner with them like never I'm really sorry. You're a great human. I love you. You're, you're incredible. And this thing is a thing that you're into. Mm -mm. I'm nope. We're not a fit. Right. Yeah. So it's not like, no, that's not a rule. That's a, that's a deal breaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very different thing. Right. So if you can align that your deal breakers aren't going to be broken in that way, then you can look at that. What would normally be considered a rule Dave and I have done something weird. We we call them best practices. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, right. Because if it's a if it's a rule, it's broken. The relationship's broken. I mean, and who, if the rule got broken, who's going to be the cop? Who's going to enforce the punishment? Who's the judge and jury? Am I going to have to? Am I going to have to police him? And is he going to be out policing me? Like with the best practice, you can just go, "Oopsie Daisy." <laughs> <laughs> I did not raise to my highest self. I will do better next time. I, I blew that best practice, right? Yeah. So it's a different, it's a different approach. And again, this is one of the things where you absolutely have to have someone with really high integrity to have this work. That you're already on the same page in so many areas. It's ridiculous. That you've already made agreements and workarounds and you've thought through if this is who you naturally are am I going to be able to support that or is this always going to be a thing and people don't often take the time to do that their person is charming and hot and funny and might have status you might be like me and need status <laughs> and you we overlook the big ones, we overlook parts of who they are. We overlook what their desires are. And this gives everybody the opportunity to put things out there on the table. So I also teach how to ask for what you need and even how to change a behavior with somebody if they're up for that. Like how can you, if there's a behavior that you're never gonna be able to live with, if if they're willing to make a change, I will set you up to have that conversation so it goes well. And so your feelings are heard and they're acknowledged. Yeah. That sounds like a really helpful thing. I might want to talk to you more about that in private. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I know that trying to change somebody is a bad idea. And I trust the way that you're saying that. I trust yeah. that you are approaching it from a place of honoring and individuality and respect. So I yes. would love to hear more. Yeah. And, and the sneaky truth is, is we can't change people, but we can give them the opportunity in a way that they can hear it to look for themselves and see if they would like to change. And sometimes they do. And sometimes they don't, but at least they'll have a really clear answer about if that change is coming or not. You know, I'm, really glad that you're bringing this up because I'm realizing there have been some relationships in my past where if my partner had had the skills to approach that conversation, things might've ended differently, but instead yeah. they just decided 
this doesn't work for me. Bye. <laughs> and you know that you never know until you ask what's worth it. There are plenty of things that are worth changing a bit for me, for certain people. So this gives me a lot of hope. Yeah. And you don't always know what's going on over there. If your partner can say to you, Hey, there's something that you do that I would really love to change. I know I can't change you, but because this thing happened, there are a dozen other things, which I'm happy to name off for you that are never available between us. We can't do X, Y, and Z because of this thing that's in our way. Are you interested in X, Y, or Z? Because if you are, a little change is in order. You want to talk about it? And if you're not, we may not be heading towards the same vision of our lives. <laughs> and that yeah. is good to know, too. Yeah. And if you can see just by this conversation, you could actually have this conversation with that person not being wrong for being the way they are, even though you'd like them to change. <sighs> <laughs> Look, you know, you're you look you're a redhead. Okay, well, that's just what it is, right? That you're this way. Okay. Now let's look at what's not available because of that. Right? Beach vacations. <laughs> <laughs> I have a family that's half full of redheads, so. Yes, exactly. Beach vacations, not in my world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, they're totally in my world under a big pull up, right? <laughs> a bit of canvas will change everything, right? Mm-hmm. So we've talked about this being really useful for women. What kind of relationship lifestyle are you targeting in particular with this product? Mm, such a great question. So like I'd mentioned, my drive is to really support women well and have them have a life that they love. And I don't have any skin in the game for what that looks like for them, whether they decide to live a very traditional white picket fence, monogamous, married life, or if they want to create a deal where they're living in side-by-side -side duplexes so they get their freedom and autonomy, or whether they're solo poly and have many, many partners, or whether they're polyamorous and have many partners and metamors and all the things, right? <laughs> I don't have any preference for relationship styles outside of that women have what they need. That's what I'm all about. What you need is what you need. And we don't need to explain it to anybody. You, you just get to live that life and you get to claim that life. And this program is specifically designed for relationships. So works great in monogamous relationship, works really great in polyamorous relationships. And it just so happens that my first marriage was monogamous and my second marriage is polyamorous. So <laughs> I can speak both languages and I can also test that it works well in both. So can we nutshell it and say this is great for people in polyamorous relationships and monogamous relationships and those that have yet to make up their minds? Yes. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome to use it in the future. Feel free. <laughs> I gotta love a kinky boots callback. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. For years, I have shared with people my top three best relationship books. And one of them is written for poly people. One of them is written for neither. And one of them is written by a Catholic, a Jesuit priest <laughs> a jesuit priest who'd been studying buddhism so uh are you interested in hearing what my favorite books are yes i was gonna ask you have to tell <laughs> us now of course the top favorite book is the ethical slut mm -hmm. not because it's an extremely fabulous book it was an extremely fabulous book and groundbreaking concept when it first came out when i first read it it's still a very very good book and in particular it's good at helping us see the differences between boundaries and comfort level and the fact that we can each own our emotions. And if we do that, we'll have happier relationships, period. 
Uh, the second book is a book by Abraham Hicks or Esther Hicks, and it's called The Vortex. And it's one book that every time I open that book and I look for something, everything I find is about honoring the other person's independence and honoring their life path and their desire. And it's, it's mm. lacking in expectation and manipulation in the best possible ways. And then the third book, the one by the Jesuit priest who studied Buddhism, that's Anthony DeMello. And the book is called The Way to Love. And it's such a brilliant book. In fact, I think a client recommended it to me or brought it for me as a gift at some point. And I started reading through it. And every chapter is very short. And most of them start with some sort of Bible scripture, which I know for some people is a definite no-no. For me, it doesn't matter to me. I think there's a lot of beautiful wisdom in the Bible, depending on how you decide to interpret it and live it in your life. And I think he does a good job of it. He shows a lot of things that inspires it, it always inspires me to think, and I've already been thinking about these types of concepts for a while. So it's got this effect of taking my relationship with relationships, my relationship with partnership deeper and allowing me to expect more from that in a healthy way. So those are my top three books. I will definitely put links in the show notes. And I will also put a link to your happy and love product course mini course it's a course yay many snack bites <laughs> many snack bites course Speaking yeah, you, of, could, you could just grab the snack bite you need or you could devour the entire big meal i love that <laughs> speaking of snack bites would you like to hear a new idea that my team and i have been coming up with i love new ideas the new idea is what if we had daily pleasure bites like a daily radiant Rebecca being delivered right into your oral canal. Oral, A-U-R-A-L, oral canal. <laughs> there might be some puns in there too. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So we've started thinking about that. And the idea is it's going to be five to 10 minutes long, daily something. And it'll have something to do with pleasure. So I think sometimes it will be like a huga hack for your house. How can you make your house feel more comfortable, more pleasant, more cozy and connected? Sometimes it'll be a poem. Last night I recorded a poem. Sometimes it'll be some of my five brightest moments. Sometimes it'll be something else that's just a little, a little snack bite, a little pleasure bite in your ear. <laughs> and, you know, my favorite thing about this idea is I've realized I have a lapel mic for my iPhone and as I'm going to bed, I'm already in the habit of saying my five brightest moments as I'm going to bed. So I'm just keeping my lapel mic by my bedstand, on my bedstand. And I plug it in before I fall asleep, put my head under the covers, and then I record the daily pleasure bite right there from bed. How cool is that? That's pretty yummy. <laughs> I mean, think about designing your life the way you want it to be. If you could spend 10 minutes every day in bed recording something yummy and get paid for that, wouldn't that be awesome? Yes, that would be amazing. Yes. So that's coming. Good job. Yeah, that's <laughs> fun. I really am excited by this. <laughs> it's a fun way of connecting and putting out some positivity in the world. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Cool. The documentarian was here yesterday in my apartment filming me on camera during the Aver Queen's Zoom session, which was very interesting because I had promised all of the women privacy. So one, he couldn't see the screen. He couldn't see their faces. Two, I had my headphones on so he couldn't hear their voices. So for two hours, all he could hear or see was me and what I was saying. And that was quite interesting because I didn't think about that until five minutes into the meeting. And then I realized, oh, my God, I have just been staring at the screen with a giant smile on my, on my face for five minutes while the women are sharing what a has they've been having all week. This must be so boring for him. But uh, I think we did get some good stuff, actually. 
And one of the other things that I was highly aware of is there was a man in the room and we were talking about emasculation. Mm. And I was very aware of that and trying to be very respectful about the way that I said things. And I think it actually turned out much for the better in many ways because I adjusted how I was talking to be less putting everybody in one basket, even though I don't do that very often, I think. But, you know, when you're teaching about something like this, it's a useful, useful teaching tool to polarize and make the distinction. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, and I think it's also really important to remember that while you and I are not men, that we're all masculine and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, men are masculine and men are feminine and women are masculine and women are feminine. So sometimes we are speaking about the opposite sex and sometimes we're speaking about the mode that we're in. I just am really looking forward to Oxford Dictionary catching up is it's just not there's got to be better words for that at this point than femininity and masculinity I think we need like 17 more words that's a good point I think we need more words (laughs) (laughs) actually I think we need more words for love too that's another word that I feel like so much gets piled onto that word it's almost impossible to know what people mean when they start saying it yes Especially when they say it in the context of, if you loved me, you would. (laughs) Wait a second. (laughs) Can I share a really cute story about love? Yeah. So I've been with my partner, uh, my, my, uh, I don't want to call him a secondary partner, my boyfriend for uh, nearly two years now. And it was about a year and a half in and he still had not said, I love you. And I had been saying it. I I started saying it some more around six months and I didn't care that he didn't say it. And I say that I didn't care, but you know, I kind of cared. And as time went on, it was like, ah, he's not ever going to say it. <laughs> and we finally came to a moment where I was sharing a story with him about how someone else had said it after a few weeks and I said to him and it's been a year and a half and you haven't even said it to me <laughs> breaking point right <laughs> right I mean he wasn't wrong I, I, but this is like this is just like driving me insane and he said can we talk about that I said no <laughs> okay yes <laughs> and we're giggling and laughing and and then he got real serious and and he said I do love you and I've been thinking about it for a while. And then he went on and he shared with me what I love you meant to him and that all the commitment that needed to be attached and that I would be in his life forever if he said that. And and it was really beautiful. And at the end of it, I said, yeah, love doesn't mean that for me. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great because then I got to express what it was for me, right? What it meant for me to say the words and that actually it was, it was coincidental that the obligations and extra stuff that he put on himself also applied to me. Like that was also true for me, but I didn't need all that there in order to say it. So you're right. I mean, love has, I think as many meanings as people. I'm sure it has more meanings than people because I feel different kinds of love for all of the different people I love. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the, hmm, I can't remember who it is, but there's some church group or organization or culture that has uh, agape love, eros love. Mm. Do you remember this? Yeah, Eros love, agape love. There's a... Amistad, the other one? I don't know what that means. It's friendship love. Oh. Adorable. Yes, that. All right, I'm nerding out and looking this up. Hang on. (laughs) Okay, it's Phylos love. Phylos love. Phylos. 
Yes. That? These are the Greek words. There we go. And ooh, ooh, they do have a lot of different words for love. So agape is love, especially charity, like the love of God for man. Eros is love, mostly sexual passion love. Philia is affectionate regard, like friendship. And then they they have a few other ones too, which I don't know how to pronounce. Storg, storge, love and affection, especially of parents or children. Philatia, hmm. uh, self-love. Oh, that's good. Sounds like fellatio though. I know that's where my brain went. Yeah, <laughs> mine too. <laughs> Xenia, guest friendship, love, like hospitality. That is so cool. All right. The Greeks were definitely ahead of the curve. Yeah. Ahead of my curve them. anyway. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Wendy. I really appreciated this conversation about love, the different types of love, and some of the ways that we can up our game in small little bites and be even happier in love. Yay. I'm going to, I'm going to get you over a link for your people so that they can get a little bit of a discount on the course. That would be so great. I'm going to be the first one to dive in. Yay. Thank you so much, Wendy. It's a pleasure to have you. Always good to be with you, Rebecca. Thank you. Hey, Pleasure Seeker. Well, that's it for today's conversation. Here at Pleasure Central Radio, we love using conscious communication, science geekery, and copious amounts of true pleasure to improve our partnerships, our money, and our love lives. And we hope you do too. If you loved what you heard here, we'd love a review. You can listen to other episodes of the podcast and read thought-provoking essays or poems written by me, Radiant Rebecca, by checking out the blog on PleasureCentralPodcast.com. Sign up to hear about new episodes immediately at PleasureCentralPodcast.com. Your thought to ponder today is... You could tell me anything. You're never going to be in trouble with me.